Hi, my name is Steve Sandra and I'm the Managing Director and CTO at PicoTest. Today I'll be discussing the fundamentals of power supply delivery networks. We'll see how bad designs can result in random, excessive voltage swings referred to as rogue waves. These waves can result in destructive power supply voltages being applied to sensitive electronic components. This video will show how these rogue waves are formed and a simple method of determining the load current stimulus required to generate the maximum voltage. You'll also learn how to recognize signs that a rogue wave is possible. This material forms the basis for designing low noise power supplies and power distribution networks. We'll cover five key points in this presentation today. What rogue waves are and how they generate catastrophic voltages. What a power distribution network is and how its impedance requirements are determined. Power systems can respond to load demands in two ways, natural response and forced response. A flat impedance versus frequency performance is more important than the maximum impedance, especially when multiple resonances exist. An optimizer simulation can easily determine the load pattern required to generate the largest rogue wave. When we're finished, you'll be able to download my simulator workspace so that you can use it as a template for evaluating your own designs. I'll also include some additional links you might find helpful. Rogue waves are abnormally large in relation to other typical waves in the area and have been documented in oceans for more than a century. More recently, we've discovered that similarly derived waves occur in power systems. As with their ocean counterparts, these rogue waves result in much larger voltage transients than expected. These oscilloscope images show the voltage response of a power supply to a load stimulus. This power supply has two impedance resonances. The two resonances are first excited separately, and then a specific stimulus pattern is applied to excite them simultaneously. The stimulus pattern creates a voltage response that is larger than either individual response. This is a very small rogue wave, but as we'll soon see, they can get much larger. In the worst case, the voltage can become large enough to permanently damage sensitive components, while in more benign cases, the rogue wave can create excessive system noise, including increased jitter and serial I.O. data links. Typical power systems are comprised of a voltage regulator module, printed circuit board planes, and decoupling capacitors. Collectively, these form the Power Distribution Network, or PDN. In a well-behaved PDN, the voltage to the load circuitry is maintained within allowable limits under all operating conditions. The prevalent guide for designing the power system is target impedance. Many companies provide guides such as this one. The load current variation is generally unknown, and 50% of maximum load is often used as an estimate. The voltage change is based on the allowable voltage range of the load circuitry, often set at 5% of the supply voltage. The design target impedance is then determined by dividing the maximum allowed voltage variation by the maximum load current change. The VRM, PC board, and decoupling capacitors are each comprised of resistive, inductive, and capacitive elements. These elements can result in the classic LC circuit resonances. Each resonance can be described by frequency, characteristic impedance, and Q, as I've shown mathematically here. Following the target impedance concept, the voltage transient is the product of the load current change and the target impedance. We'll use a 2.5 volt, 2 amp power system for our examples. The target impedance guideline would establish the peak impedance to be 125 milliohms. I've applied Laplace transformations to evaluate the voltage responses to a current step and to a sinusoidal current waveform at the resonant frequency. I've applied Fourier to a square current waveform also at the resonant frequency. You won't need to use Laplace or Fourier, I just wanted to show you the mathematical basis. Instead, we'll use a time domain simulator to excite our simple single resonance power delivery network. The response to a step, or natural response, is an exponentially decaying voltage transient. The response to the sine and square wave, or forced response, are both much larger than the natural response. Rather than exponentially decaying, the forced response exhibits exponential growth. This oscilloscope image shows a natural response to a step load and a forced response to a square load current stimulus at the resonant frequency. 
both the exponential decay and exponential growth are seen here. As expected, the force response is much larger than the natural response. The natural response can be transformed to the forced response, or the forced response can be transformed to the natural response as functions of Q. Based on the resonant Q of 5.6 in our example, the sine forced response is 3.2 times larger than the step response, while the square forced response is 4.1 times larger than the step response. The ratio of the square excitation will always be related to the sine excitation by a factor of 4 over pi, as a Fourier response would easily confirm. This exponential growth is an important consideration in the generation of the rogue wave and can be determined from the Q of the impedance resonance. The time to reach near maximum amplitude determines how many cycles are required at each frequency in the load stimulus. This graph shows the number of cycles required to reach 85, 90, 95, and 99 percent of maximum amplitude as a function of the resonant Q. A good rule of thumb is that Q plus 0.5 cycles results in approximately 95 percent as indicated by the black dots. In the real world, power systems are more complex and are comprised of several resonances, not just one. The rogue wave is the result of adding the responses from multiple resonances, so at least two resonances are required to generate the wave. I'll use three impedance resonances, each with a peak impedance close to the target impedance and at arbitrary frequencies. One resonance represents the VRM, a second represents the PC board inductance and large decoupling capacitors, while a third represents the smaller decoupling capacitors. An actual high-speed circuit could have many more, including the bond wire and die capacitance at the chip level. Simulating this impedance, only one resonance is apparent. This illustrates why I always want to use a log frequency display for both my measurements and my simulations. Changing from a linear frequency display to a log frequency display, all three resonances are now visible. So now let's go ahead and generate the rogue wave. Our load circuit is comprised of two square wave pulse sources, each switching from 0 to 2 amps. The first is set to the approximate resonant frequency and runs continuously throughout the simulation. After a delay, the second frequency is introduced and also runs continuously throughout the simulation. After a delay, the third frequency is introduced as a six cycle burst. This method makes it easier to constrain the maximum current and also reduces the simulation time. Simulating this initial solution results in a rogue wave indicated by the larger than expected amplitude. The next step is to determine the load stimulus pattern required to achieve the largest rogue wave. While this would be difficult to calculate manually, I'll use a simulation optimizer to do the work for us. The optimizer is made up of three parts. The first part defines which parameters can be adjusted and over what range. Next are goal statements, defining what is to be optimized. In this case, one goal is to generate the maximum voltage from our transient simulation. A second goal is to limit the maximum load current to 2 amps. Next is the optimizer controller. The default random algorithm with 100 iteration attempts is being applied to our example. The optimizer error function is displayed while the optimizer runs. The output voltage can also be viewed while the optimizer runs. After a few minutes, the optimizer has determined the maximum voltage excursion, and the schematic can be updated with the final optimizer values. The circuit has symmetry, so by rearranging a few polarities, an equivalent excursion is generated in the opposite direction. A 750 millivolt rogue wave was generated using a 125 milliohm target impedance and a 2 amp step. For comparison, I'll simulate this circuit using a flat 125 milliohm impedance along with our rogue wave pattern. In order to obtain the correct mean voltage, the 2.5 volt VRM voltage is increased to 2.625 volts. Using the same target impedance value, the voltage is now approximately within the desired limits. It's important that the impedance response is flat and not just be below the target impedance limit. While rogue waves may seem unlikely, consider this. 
arbitrarily setting the likelihood of a rogue wave to be one in a quintillion, a 2 gigahertz pattern could achieve a rogue wave every five and a half days. Even at 100 megahertz, this could occur three times per year. In this video, I've shown that rogue waves can exist in power systems and the importance of designing a resonant-free power system. I've also provided a method using the Keysight ADS optimizer to determine the load current pattern required to achieve the maximum voltage. If you'd like to explore these power integrity examples, you can download the ADS workspace I used by clicking on the link in the text description associated with this video, or by typing in the URL shown on this slide.